Director of Clinical Content here at Networker. Uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar with us, Psychotherapy Networker is all about creating change in therapy and inspiring therapists to do that themselves. We do it in our courses, we do it uh, in our magazine, and now we're bringing it to you here in the social media space. If you want to check out our magazine and get an exclusive discount for the subscription, look at the link on your screen today and also in the chat uh, to check us out. Uh, today, we are welcoming back our third episode of What Makes Change. We have our host with us, Ron Tappel, the chair of the, bo of, of the board of directors at the Institute of Contemporary Psychotherapy and a long-term or long-time networker contributor. Uh, and he is joined by his guest, Angela Diaz, who is the director of Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center, a program that is pro that provides comprehensive health and mental health services to adolescents and young adults. Uh, she has served as a White House Fellow, a member of the FDA Pediatric Advisory Committee, and is active in public health and advocacy across the U.S. and around the world. Ron, I will turn it right over to you to get us started. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, hi, Angela. It's, hi, how are you, Ron? Okay, all right, good. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Um, so uh, tell me just, uh, and everyone, a little bit about the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. Just just a, a couple of minutes so people can get an idea of what it is that you're, you do. And what, sure. Okay. The Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center is a program for young people ages 10 to 26. And we provide them with services in, in an integrated model of medical, sex and reproductive health, dental, optical health education, nutrition, behavior and mental health and legal services. So it's really taking a look at the entire person. I also says from mental to dental or from head to toes. Mm -hmm. And um, the young people can come from anywhere, you know, basically on the globe. If they show up and they are 10 to 26, we serve them. Everything is provided at no cost to them. And we pay for any laboratory tests that they may need, most other medication, and give them metro card for transportation. We are trying to, we aspire to have a program with as little barriers as possible for young people because we really want to serve them. Yeah. Um, Angela, you've been doing this a long time. I've been running a community agency and a, a teaching institute for a long time. What do you see that's, that's different? What do you think that adolescents and young adults and up to 26, I think of it even as uh, older, but uh, just what what is different in terms of what they need? You know, I think that young people that age need services that are developmentally appropriate. And also that those services are designed in such a way that they can utilize them. And what I mean by that is like, I sit down with the young people and I said to them, what are potential barriers that are going to keep you from coming for the services that we provide and that you need and also what are potential facilitators and then we create a program like that because of that the young people we make it easy for them to come in and what i mean by that is they can make appointment they can also walk in um, they can come for a medical visit because they don't feel well or they need a physical exam to go to college or for working papers and during that visit we ask them all type of things, including about their well-being, and we ask, you know, ask them about what are they thinking, what are they feeling, what are they doing. So by the time we end up talking with them, and we spend most of the time talking with them, taking a history, we had a sense of that young person, the strength and the area of a struggle. And for example, if I think that they can ben I'm a medical doctor, I see my young person, and if I think they can benefit from seeing a mental health person, we have designed the program in a way that we have people who are mental health professionals with flexible schedule, working right next to the medical professionals so that that young person that same day can get the mental health uh, services that they need, almost seamless. So yeah. I don't have to say to them, I'm going to refer you to mental health. I can say, you know, Ron is my colleague and we work together and just connect you to that person. It's, it sounds to me like the, um, the interpersonal connection feels like the way that you're describing it, even though it's, it's 
layered, it feels like it's important. Um, and I wonder if when you sit in the room with an adolescent or someone in their 20s, um, how, what, what, what strikes you? Uh, what have you seen that's different? Because I know it's changed for me over the years um, and changed in my work. So is there anything that you're seeing that you're feeling in the room that's different? You know, what I will say is that every human needs relationship, mm -hmm. especially the young people, the adolescent and young adults. So I think actually that the relationship is healing in addition to whatever techniques we use. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important. We also, many of our young people are black and brown, like 94% and low income. So often they have encountered um you know, they interact with certain sectors in a way that is not very positive. So when they come here to the center, to our clinic, they are treated with love, you know, respect. They are seen as human. We really want to work with them. We really want to partner with them. So if you ask a young person that come here, why do they come here? Mm -hmm. They say mm -hmm. they come here because they feel welcome, mm -hmm. respected, connected, safe, and not judged. So as young yeah. people want people to really see them and care for them for who they are and be authentic and honest and not judge them. They don't want to be judged. How do you, how do you get that across in a, in a first visit? To get across that the, the love, the feeling, the respect, the caring, is it? You know, I was sorry, but by the way we treat them, I'm, even when, let's say, if we go to the waiting room and we meet the young person very warmly, you know, introduce myself, ask them how they are, bring them to, to the room. And if they are with a family, you know, just making everyone feel welcome and how can I help you um, and things like that. So it's, it's really the interaction itself and how you treat them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we do services confidentially here. So we will go over that with the family and the young person. And, uh, but, but at the same time, we understand that the family need to feel included and part of the process, even though if we are going to see the young person confidentially, it's like an art. Yeah. So after I talk to the family in front of the young person and the young person themselves, I mean, they're the main um, client. Then I will say to the family, I'm going to invite you to wait in the waiting room until I finish with your child, or you, you know, and then I will bring you back into the room and answer any question you may have and so on and so forth. So it's about the interaction and the family is feeling included and the young person feeling that they can really share with you what's really going on in their lives because you are going to be able to um, keep that private. And we tell them ahead of time that certain things we cannot keep private, like if they're suicidal or they know a gang is going to kill someone or they uh, may kill themselves, you know, they're thinking they're suicidal. We obviously cannot keep that private, but overall, everything else. And, and also we say to the young person, we think it's really important for you to talk with your parents. And they may say to us, uh, they will kill me. They know I'm gay, for example. Mm -hmm. And we will say, um, no, no, you know, if you want, you can bring your family here. We help you tell them. We will support you. So eventually, even if we see the kids confidentially initially and the young people can come by themselves, eventually, because we talk with them and we work about their family and we facilitate things for them, I think we end up helping them connect more to their families and, and communicate better. That's so interesting because so much of, um, the psychotherapy world has been on differentiating from one's family. Mm -hmm. And in some way, I think you're saying that it's important to figure out a way to help them to connect with their family in a way that's different. Um, I've seen that in my work a lot. It's changed over the years. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, if you've seen that as well, that this, this being able to make the connection between family members is critical to healing, to change. Yes. You know, and we, because we, we can work with a young person all we want, and um, you know, they still have to deal with the family dynamics, right? Right. 
So the more they understand each other, the more they can communicate, the more they can support each other, the better for everyone. And I think some of the issues sometimes that you see the conflict with parents and youth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that sometimes adults, not just parents, but even clinicians, teachers, we tend to sometimes see young people as if they are adults from an adult lens, mm -hmm. and they are not. They are developmentally different. They think you know, differently. So we need to remember where they are developmentally and not have expectations that are from the adult perspective. So all those things, understanding that, helping parents understand that and how to really accept and love their kids. Like, for example, we have a huge transgender program. We have helped transition more than 800 youth. We give them the hormones and everything. And sometimes the parents, you know, that's something relatively new. And sometimes the parents don't know how to take that. Or they say, where is my, you know, my child and I was different. And, you know, so we just also sit down with the parents, you know, to help them understand and love their kids for whoever they are. Their child is who they are, you know. Um, so it's just helping that. And sometimes we provide support groups and that type of thing. Um, do you do you have a sense of um, just can you remember a situation where you actually were able to, in a family of high conflict, were able to in, in some way get them to start talking to each other about something that was new and difficult? Yeah. You know, we have, um, we do family therapy and we have people without expertise. Some of the staff have that, have that expertise. So it's not infrequent to see that conflict initially. Mm -hmm. And we work with a young person on their own in individual therapy, but we say we, we really need your family. Who is your family? And the family could be whoever the kid says. It could be one person. It could be five people. And then just bringing and trying to understand that dynamic and then helping um each other, the, the young person and the adult, really see each other perspective and start with little incremental way on trying to understand and support each other. Uh, so that's one way. You know, there or something else that we see a lot, we see a lot of interpersonal violence. Mm -hmm. About 23% of my um, patients who are, um, you know, female, uh, cis or trans females um, have a history of um sexual abuse it, it could be in, mostly incest but also other type of sexual abuse and rape it's also trying to understand the dynamic of that and understanding that sometimes the young person the same person that abused them let's say sexually is the same person that is supposed to protect them mm -hmm. and the young person has to live with that and have to manage that because they cannot necessarily live by themselves they still need to live at home so it's also helping with those type of dynamics and understanding and do whatever we need to do to help the young person feel supported and understood. And how do you deal with the ongoing uh, trauma? Because you and I have talked about that, that you see trauma every day. Um, and how do you enter the system and turn it into some kind of trauma work? You know, the way that I got into, the, I'm trained as a pediatrician and mm -hmm. adolescent medicine physician. But in the mid 80s, you know, I was doing my history and physical exam because that's what I was trained to do nice. with teenagers. I was friendly, it was team friendly, but still I was doing my more traditional medical stuff. And some medical students came to do a um, research project in the clinic. At that time, I was training in adolescent medicine. And they found that 58 percent of the young women waiting to be seen for routine health care, 58 percent had a history of sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. And I was a trainee, mm -hmm. but I knew something was wrong because no one has spoken to me about sexual trauma in the clinic and not the medical people, not the mental health staff. No. Uh, so um, at that time, I said to the person who was running the program that I wanted to really explore more these numbers because they just seem so huge and i went and i reviewed the literature and all that and eventually i said to him i would love to start a program for young people who are survivor of incest sexual abuse and also survivor of rape and obviously they have different dynamics so i did two different programmatic mm -hmm. interventions and then since then i started asking every single young person that i see you know male female uh, cis or trans um, I say to them, let's say about sexual abuse, has anyone 
ever touch your body when you didn't want them to. Your breast, your vagina, your penis, your anus. And then, um, you know, was it your father, your mother, your grandparents, your teacher? And I do this so that they know that I know that those things happen. And that if they share that with me, I will be able to handle it. And something that I learned recently is that it's really important when young people or any person is traumatized to have someone to share that with someone, like to a witnessing, to witness, yeah, witness to have a yeah. witness to mm -hmm. their trauma, because that helps start the healing process in addition to what other techniques mm -hmm. you use for the intervention. So I will say our program overall has become trauma informed, trauma responsive. And then we have a specific intervention, trauma specific interve interventions mm -hmm. like trauma focused cog cognitive behavioral therapy dialectical behavioral therapy, EMDR. So we do different modalities in addition to the more psychodynamic um, psychotherapy and things like that. So we are just, I would say most of our youth have a history of trauma, including racism, because 94% mm -hmm. are black and brown, but also I mentioned already the sexual trauma to that you ask, physical abuse, neglect, community violence, um, endless things. So, and 70% have complex chronic trauma. So we, I work with a very highly traumatized population, but because of the way we work with them and how accepted they feel and we witness their, their violence and then they get by professional mental health people who have a skill set, they get the interventions. The young people do, I think, very, very well, given the life challenges that they have had. And that's really, really important. It sounds to me like you asked the question. You asked yeah. the questions that need to be asked. And I mean, at, at ICP, we, we see about 700 patients a week. And we always are learning things as we go on in the therapy that we didn't, in fact, like all therapists, think to ask. Or it's, And it also sounds like a history, that you get a history from people. You get that history from the, adolescent, from the patients themselves, not just the families from the, uh, the kids yeah. themselves? You know, something that I learned the hard way, that, um, mm -hmm. like when the medical student came to do the research that I yeah. knew that, I said, how come we have 58% of the young women waiting to be seen medically with a mm -hmm. history of sexual trauma and no one knew? You know, I reviewed the literature, but I also realized yeah. right. Right. we don't yeah. know that mm -hmm. because we're not asking them. And right. obviously they're not sharing that spontaneously with us. So I learned. That's why I started asking every single person the way that I, that I mentioned that I asked. And I asked the entire history from beginning to end from the young person. Because they are the one. Yes, you them. Yes, they you are the, them. Yeah. They are the one that really know. The, the, they have the lived experience. They are the experts on their own lives. I mean, I asked from the family whatever I need to mm -hmm. ask from the mm -hmm. family. But whatever I ask the family, I go back and I ask the, the young person the entire history from them. Mm. Well, I was thinking that you have you have decided to um, to learn more about psychotherapy. You said something to me that was really quite, I, I think, honest and interesting. That you said that everyone thinks we know how to do psychotherapy, or that I know how to do psychotherapy. But there were things that I wanted to learn. What 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 was it? What is it that you that you're now seeing in psychotherapy that that is applicable to what it is that you're doing? You know, so I usually when you get trained medically, it's a just different type of training. We learn about diseases, how to identify them, how to diagnose them, how to treat them. But I think when, we, when you work with youth, um, it's really important to, to be broader than that. And adolescent medicine, we, got, we have probably have wider training than most other um, professionals that, that work with teenagers other than the, the behavioral and mental health people. But I just want to really see the person in their totality. totality. I want to be able to, to, to identify and, and address their depression, their anxiety, to really you know, have an integrated program where we have about 15 different disciplines because everyone has their expertise. And then we come together to serve the young person in their totality. Uh, bringing all the pieces of the experts that, that, that we have 
to serve them. And I think engagement, you know, connecting with the youth, um, really feeling comfortable with them. Not everyone, I always say, when you work with teenagers, you either love them or just stay away from them. You know, there's not so much in between. It's just getting really connecting. I think it's really important for youth to connect. They're social beings. And that's yeah. one of the issues that I think during COVID, mm -hmm. we are seeing so, I mean, Men, no, behavioral mental health was also a huge, huge rate in, in, in adolescent and young adults before the pandemic, and there's not enough capacity. So only a small fraction of, of the young people that need those services actually get it. But then in the pandemic, then you have a trifecta of the pandemic, COVID-19, the, the um, financial crisis, the racial reckoning, and the fact that school were closed, I'm talking about New York City, the school were closed. So the kids didn't, were more socially isolated. They had interruption of their routine. Also, there was interruption of like graduation and proms and going to college. So their life was really altered. So, so those rituals that are so important for development were not there. And some youth did very well during the pandemic because maybe they were being bullied in school and now they were not being bullied because they were at home. But many of them really miss that social connection. And um, so the, we are seeing higher rates of depression, anxiety, interpersonal violence, including you know, sexual abuse, rape, tendering violence, domestic violence, and human trafficking. We work with young people who are being trafficked as well. And in addition to all the more traditional things that people are talking about, the financial impact and, and the infections, and 33% of over 400 youth that completed a survey that we have said they had lost a loved one during the yeah. pandemic, yeah. usually a relative. Yes, Sometimes the they lost the only parent that they had. That's right. I think that piece of it, the grief and the loss, um, is, is it, we're skipping over that step in being able to help uh, just the incredible uh, losses that have happened during this time. And I think you must be seeing this because I know that we are seeing this all the time. And we've been paying more attention recently um, over the last couple of years to grief as a process and as a process that we need to help uh, just young people you know, get through, not just older people, but young people especially. So do you have any uh, groups for uh, kids or uh, young adults who have lost um, who have lost their parents or lost relatives in the, in the pandemic? You know, the staff is really good about um, grief and bereavement and support. And we do different type of, um, of groups for, for young people. Um, and so we are very aware and the staff know all the things that the young person is bringing to us. Um, so they address them. They're, they really try to work on all of those things. Yeah. Angela, if you had to think of something that you could say to, to therapists, is it a wide audience here? Something that you've learned over either the last years or whatever it is that would be important to take into the therapy relationship um, with our younger clients? Like, what do you think you would say to us? You know, to me, the major, you know, one of the major things is that young people want to be accepted for who they are. So whatever, you know, to love them the way they are, who they are. And even if they are doing certain things, we can try to guide them and, and show them. But I always say, for example, that if I work with a young person and we are trying to work on whatever to, for them to do or not do, even if they continue to do the things that we are working towards not doing, mm -hmm. I want them for, to continue to come every time and not be afraid to come, not feel mm -hmm. that I'm going to judge them, but mm -hmm. to feel comfortable that we are here still for them, that we are going to try one next time. And also for the young person to feel connected. I think young people often, even when they're surrounded by people, you know, like school, by other students, by teachers in the street, they are sometimes very alone. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you are surrounded by people, but you feel lonely and alone. So I think the main thing is to help those young people not feel alone, to feel that there's someone there, 
every step of the way, that no matter what they're up to, they can come and they can connect and somebody's going to listen to them and work with them. So it's not giving up, basically. Yeah. It's like what we do with our own kids. Mm -hmm. You know, right. we don't just say disappear because you're not doing what I'm telling you to do. You know, mm -hmm. we still have to love them. And I know it's not, I know it's not easy because I've raised three kids, um, but it's really been there, that constancy, that clarity, that empathy, that honesty, being there with them so that they feel that they are not alone. There's nothing worse than a person feeling that they are alone, especially a young person with nowhere to go. Well, you know what, when you say it like Angela, it's, um, there's something about saying this that applies to everyone, for young people, older people, whoever it is that they don't come into treatment and all of a sudden give up what it is that they've been doing just because they're in therapy with us. And you're saying that you make it very clear that even if you continue with what you're doing, we will still work with you. We'll go step by step. We'll be here for you so that you're not alone. Yeah. And I think that that simple truth um, hits at the core of psychotherapy mm -hmm. because there's such an emphasis now to get and change something immediately. Yeah. And something right. like that simple. Sometimes young people, like we allow them to walk in, for, especially for medical, mm -hmm. and then we can connect them to the mental health. So sometimes, as that say, if you always allow them to walk in, then mm -hmm. they will never learn to make a point. And in other places, nobody will see them. And I just say, if, you know, if we don't allow them to come in, if we just say, you can, we will not see you, you have to make an appointment. That poor kid may disappear. Only God knows why they were coming. We'll never know. Maybe they were suicidal. Maybe they were just raped. Maybe they just needed a physical to go to university. But we don't know. And I say, if we allow them to come in and we embrace them, you know, with the way we work with them, the love, the attention, the caring, they are more likely to then learn how to make appointment, how to follow structure, than if we reject them, because if we reject them, it's one more rejection in a universe where they're always rejected. People are not comfortable necessarily with teenagers. They don't love teenagers. Look at the media, the way they are portrayed. So we just really need to shift all the way we see them. Yeah. Well, you also feel that for kids that are um, teenagers and also for young adults up to 20. Mm -hmm. Six, 26, 26. So the same, the same thoughts, because we work with a large population of young adults at ICP. Mm -hmm. um, the average age is uh, somewhere just under 30. Mm -hmm. So it's in the 20s still. So um, it still holds for 20-somethings. Um, the same message, because we're, we're thinking of adolescence as going further and further and further out. So you'd say the same thing for young adults as well. Yes? Yes. And this program, when it began, it only went to age 18. I, I know. And, yeah. um, you know, we knew, and actually I was a patient, when I was a teenager, I was, a, um, I was depressed and I was a high school dropout. And I came to this program, I was about probably 17 at that time. And it was the psychotherapy that they gave me in such a timely moment of desperation that I needed it so badly that helped me then and with their encouragement get back to high school. But I knew when I turned 18, they say I was already, I aged out, but I was no way near right. ready or healthy. So because of that, we have been expanding the age, um, not because of that, but that's, you know, end of, end of one, we having ex we see that with other kids that when you are 19, you are very similar to 17. When you're 21, the issues and many young people are very, very, very similar. So we decided to go to 26 because by then those going to college are more likely to be done with college. And those are working are more likely to be working and have health insurance and be more stable, be mm -hmm. on relationships, you know, much more stability by age. We see them until the 27th birthday, like the day before. By then they're much more likely to be stable and be on track mm -hmm. to do whatever type of life they, 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 they aspire and hope to have. Yeah. What I'm taking from this, and we have just a couple minutes left, what I'm taking from this is that you really go at the where the person is in their whole environment. And then you, you go kind of not step by step as if it's linear, but just at what you can manage to do a little bit at a time. And it sounds like that's what also happened with you in, in, in your life, right? That's, that's how uh, it, it made 
like all the difference in the world for you. And when I think about change, I think about it for myself as well. It was really step by step by step in different, just all different ways that I didn't expect. And one of the things that I'm hearing is that you're, uh, we at, at ICP, we have uh, six, seven different training programs um, and numbers of different modalities. And it sounds like at Sinai, you have many different uh, approaches because the networker is all about different mm -hmm. approaches under one mm -hmm. roof. And, and it sounds yes. like that's what you have. Yes. Um, why? Why did you decide to go into, you know, to get involved with so many different DBT, CBT, psychodynamic, family trauma? What, what, what was it through over the years? I think it's because different kids may need different things. Right. Or different youth may want to be in therapy for a different length of time and things like that. So I just think that the more you have to offer the young people, you can match more mm -hmm. um, their strength with what you have and serve them in that way or give them if something doesn't work it's like family planning methods we try them on birth control pill if that doesn't work they don't want it then we try something else and we keep trying until we find perhaps the method that they're much more likely to stick to and, and that will do the job so so it's having choices and having you know and trying to match so the staff are really good at seeing what we do is when we see the young person we take this history of what you are thinking, feeling, and doing. We know them very well. We get, you know, they share with us. They're like an open book. And then we take that, what they share with us, to, to do an individualized intervention uh, for that person specific, depending on what they told us and what they want. And then we bring the different pieces to them. And if you have variety, then you can try to choose what is more likely to work or what the young person wants and is likely to stick to or not. And even if they don't stick to it, they can come back, you know. Well, I, I feel the the acceptance mm -hmm. that I think it is that um, you're offering. And you've been doing this now for decades, right? How long? I'm a month and 41 years. 41 years. <laughs> and uh, I've been with ICP. We know each other for a long time, for yes. also about 40 years. And it's yes. about, it seems to be that what I love about this is that we're always learning. Yes. Right. And yes. that's um, what I feel like we're, we're trying to do. There are a lot of questions, um, but I think we've run out of our time. And I think that there's some way in which uh, I feel very welcomed um, by by what you're describing and by by you. Um, oh, thank you. Th yeah. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Angela. And thank you uh, for having thank me. You, thank you, Anna, for making uh, time for us to, to just talk together. Of course. I just want to thank you both for this wonderful conversation. And Angela, thank you so much for the work that you do. I think at a time that we really, really need it, uh, you're instilling so much hope for our younger generation. And I I imagine that this will inspire a lot of uh, our community to maybe approach things a little bit differently or take some risks in how they're supporting their youth. So uh, just very grateful. Thank you to our audience. I know there were some questions in the chat that we did not have a chance to get to. Yeah. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, be sure to check out the link in the chat for uh, your exclusive mm -hmm. discount for the magazine and join us next month for our next episode of What Makes Change. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you.